Hello and welcome to my session Embracing Observability in Distributed Systems. My name is Michael Hausenblas. I'm an open source product developer advocate in the AWS Container Service Team. And the focus here is really on observability in the context of distributed systems, for example, uh, containerized microservices. Now let's have a look at the more traditional setup that we have. And that would be a monolith, right? So you would have uh, a number of different modules in that monolith. Uh, for example, in this case, that might be a e-commerce uh, application. You have uh, interfaces with external systems like payment or single sign-on um, or uh, some risk profiles or an ERP stock application. And obviously you're talking to your clients, you want to sell something. Now, if you take that monolith and you break it apart into a number of microservices, obviously the better you did a job of modularizing your um, original monolith, the easier it is now for these simple, uh, smaller microservices to exist and to interact. But what are the characteristics if you look at um, the overall setup of such a, for example, containerized microservices system? Pros, what speaks for it is on the one hand, you have increased developer velocity because different teams can now be responsible and can iterate independently from each other um, for different microservices. And they can have different uh, release cycles, etc., testing, etc., and um, that makes the whole thing faster. You end up with a polyglot systems system in, in the sense of that you potentially have different um, programming languages and different data stores there uh, that you can optimize for the task at hand. For example, you might write the renderer in Node.js, and the payment options uh, microservice might be uh, in Java. And last but not least, you also have what I would call partial high availability, meaning that parts of the system might go down. However, to the end user, it still looks like there is some functionality available. Think of, for example, an e-commerce setup, you might not be able to search for something, but you can still check out um, some something in your uh, shopping basket. Now, what are the cons? Well, it is a distributed system now. And very likely, those different microservices uh, end up on different nodes. Think of, for example, Kubernetes, where each of the microservices might, for example, be a deployment and pods uh, owned by that deployment. And that ends up in, in, uh, on different nodes. And the different microservices now end up using uh, networking to talk to each other. It is much more complex than a monolith, right? It's it's uh, already hard uh, to uh, figure out how different parts work together in, in the case of a monolith, but in case of the uh, distributed system, in the case of a, a microservices system, uh, you have a lot of additional complexity. We get back to that uh, in a moment. So one of the biggest challenges in this context of a uh, microservice setup is the observability of the overall system. And that is equally true for developers and uh, for operation folks. So let's have a look at the challenges. Thinking of that we're talking about a distributed system, one of the things you have to wonder is how to keep track of the time and location of different signals. You might wonder what is the right retention period of a signal? How long should you keep around the logs? Maybe you are required to keep around the logs for a certain period of time for regulatory purposes. You have to consider the return of investment. By that, I mean that it is a certain effort, for example, for a developer to instrument their application, their microservice. It is a certain, it costs money to, uh, have the, the signals around to store them, etc. to have uh, applications to look at these different signals. 
So you want to make sure that whatever effort and whatever money you put in there, you have a clear outcome and a clearly defined uh, scope what you get for it. And last but not least, the different signals may be relevant uh, to different roles in different circumstances. For example, a developer looking at troubleshooting or profiling their uh, microservice along a request path uh, might need a different set of tools compared to someone from the infrastructure uh, team looking at a Kubernetes cluster, for example. So take a look at that and keep that in mind when we discuss uh, the following things and also later on on the Q&A. Before we get into uh, the landscape and what is going on currently, especially in CNCF, let's have a look at the basics, the observability basics. So when I talk about observability, I mean the entity of all the things that you see there, all the sources that might be an app or microservices in, in our case here, it might be infrastructure sources, um, like for example, a VPC flow log or a database, data store, uh, you typically you know, treat them as, as opaque. You don't know what's going on inside. You get some signal out there. Um, the compute unit, compute engine, so for example, containers or functions or whatever. And then you have some uh, compute engine uh, that, uh, that actually runs, executes your code. You have the telemetry bits that uh, include usually agents, uh, SDKs, protocols, etc., that take, uh, route, ingest uh, the signals from the sources into some destinations. A couple of, of different types of des destinations there. There are things like dashboards where you can look at how metrics are doing over time, for example. You might have alerts, you have long term storage, for example, you put some logs on, in, in an S3 bucket. Um, ultimately, this is what you really want, right? The, the sources and the telemetry bits, that is what you have to invest. You have to instrument your code. You have to um, you know, deploy agents to collect uh, signals and, and forward them, ingest them into some destination. But what you ultimately want, um, you want to consume them, right? You want to do something with that signals, generate insights and make decisions based on those signals. And the last thing you want to do in the context of a distributed system is obviously to fly blind. A different way to view this, not from this pipeline point of view, but from a more uh, conceptually, um, you know, decomposed point of view is performing um, what is called a morphological analysis. This is a problem solving method uh, developed by um, a Swiss uh, astrophysicist called Fritz Tricky. And um, the basic idea is that you decompose your solutions into um, small units that are more or less independent. So in this case, you would have uh, six dimensions. Of course, you, know, you can have more or less, depending on how you view it. I came up with these uh, six dimensions there. Analytics, which, as I said, is what you actually want to have. You want to consume them. You want to store signals. The telemetry bit, again, this is, uh, you know, agents. This is protocols, uh, like open metrics, for example. Uh, you have the languages, the program languages, uh, that as a developer you are most interested in, does uh, a certain uh, set of telemetry uh, technologies support uh, your programming language? Are they available there? Can you use them in your programming language? The infrastructure piece. Uh, where you have on the one hand things like um, compute related uh, sources that could be, for example, Docker logging drivers, VPC flow logs, S3 bucket logs, but also data stores. Very important. Um, you almost always have some state uh, involved and very often these are opaque uh, boxes. So you get some signals out, but uh, you can't really look inside that box. Then the compute unit, uh, as I said, in this case, uh, highlighted for what we have in, in AWS. I think of, you know, EKS, for example, which is Kubernetes, uh, Lambda function, et cetera, et cetera. And then, so compute unit referring to um, the way how a certain uh, service or microservice is uh, scheduled and, and um, exposed. And the compute engine is the actual runtime environment, for example, EC2 or Fargate or Lightsaber. Now, this allows um, a relatively straightforward way to answer the question, 
for a specific workload, for a specific example, what options are available. Let's, for example, say you're running EKS on Fargate, you're interested in logs, so you have also the, the logging driver there from, from Docker, are you writing your microservice in Java, might be using FluentBit to ship the logs and uh, route the logs, and you're consuming the logs in the context of Elasticsearch. So there you have one particular path through um, these uh, six dimensions, and you can imagine that there are many, many uh, combinations possible. Now let's move on to signals. Really just a very quick, um, you know, um, making sure that we are all on the same page regarding the signals. We have essentially three, the three pillars, which are the logs, um, essentially discrete events that usually are timestamped and can be structured, for example, uh, in JSON here. Metrics, which are regularly sampled, numerical data values that are usually with dimensions and labels that capture their semantics. And for example, the way a destination to view them is Grafana, a very popular one. And traces, which are the signals that, you know, uh, what happens along the request path in, in, a, in a number of microservices. So think of um, a request comes in the front end of our microservice and that propagates to the system. Um, and touches different microservices, and all these things together are taken that's a trace. Here um, shown Jaeger, which is a very popular um, front end to um, you know, render uh, traces, and there you see at a glance how long does a request take, and then you can drill in and see where exactly along the request path in which of the microservices um, the, the time is spent and also usually you get uh, access to the logs and can specifically look at logs of a particular uh, microservice. Now let's switch gears a little bit and have a look at what is going on in terms of observability at the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the CNCF. As you can probably guess from this picture, a lot is going on here. And this is just a snapshot. If you want to have a look at uh, landscape.cncf.io, you get a, a more up-to-date and, and current picture. Um, a lot of, of open source and commercial offerings in this space uh, along the, the different uh, signals that we already discussed, uh, metrics, the uh, logs and traces, but also chaos engineering. So uh, CNCF, uh, rightly so, takes chaos engineering as part of the observability story. In terms of open source projects and specifications, we have uh, various graduation um, levels there. The, the three graduated projects are um, Prometheus, uh, Jaeger, and FluentD. Then we have Cortex and Thanos that are incubating, and OpenTelemetry, OpenMetrics, and Chaos Mesh, which are, and Litmus, I'm sorry, uh, that are uh, sandbox projects. And uh, depending on uh, adoption and uh, the, the due diligence outcome, uh, the projects uh, evolve and you know, get higher up in that hierarchy. There is an additional special interest group called SIG Observability that I'm a member of and contributing to that you can think of kind of working across the different projects, doing things like due diligence, uh, white papers, uh, general forum for, um, you know, exchanging um, experiences around observability. And I would like to encourage you to have a look at that and maybe join us. In late September 2020, the CNCF in the end user space did a, a technology radar on observability solutions and came up with um, a nice blog post and, and a content piece, a video that you might want to uh, study and, and get, make, have a look at that and, and make make up your mind what you think of, of these uh, assessments here. And now let's move on to um, concrete examples for different signals. First, that we have a look at uh, our logs. Logs are relatively established. When I look at um, the discussions that I'm having with uh, our customers uh, at AWS, then this is something that pretty much everyone is already doing and has been doing for quite a while. So in this case, we're looking at uh, Fluent bit in ECS where it's um, called Firelands, and you can essentially um, more or less in a simple declarative manner route your logs 
from your containers, from your tasks, to or through the, the Firelands container um, to the destinations, as you see here on the right hand side. And this is really um, this basic idea that as a user, you should, um, besides the instrumentation effort that you have in the context of your um, of your own microservices and, and applications, in terms of the tele telemetry bit, you should really only be focusing on um, the, the configuration and the rest should be provided by the uh, overall system, by the platform that you're running it. Let's move on to metrics. Um, remember metrics being these numerical values that are uh, emitted at regular um, time intervals. And in this case, what we're looking here, the use case would be you have a service mesh that um, produces metrics. In this case, um, we're using Linkerd, but you could also think of you know, App Mesh or Istio that use uh, Envoy in the data plane. So you have as a sidecar a, a um, proxy sitting that intercepts all the traffic. And because it intercepts all the traffic, it can also um, emit metrics on these, on what is going on on the wire, so to speak. That is, um, you know, scraped by Prometheus and in this case, um, ingested into Grafana, where you then can do dashboards and can, you know, say, what is the success rate? What, uh, you know, how many 200s on the, on the HTTP level or whatever uh, have I seen, et cetera, et cetera. And this is usually, especially in the context of service measures, nowadays almost out of the box, which means you really don't have a lot uh, work there to do. Again, coming back to this, you should be focusing on, on the configuration and declarative, declaratively tell the system where and how you want to consume your signals. Moving on to the last example, um, the uh, distributed tracing, in this case with uh, X-Ray, AWS X-Ray, um, a managed service that we we offer. And in this setup that I uh, showed you here, uh, it is the source being a uh, service in uh, deployed in EKS, which is our uh, Kubernetes managed service. And the telemetry bit is actually ADOT, and ADOT being our AWS uh, distribution for open telemetry. And um, Pretty straightforward, as you can see, um, consuming these traces in, in X-Ray, uh, akin to what we've earlier seen with, with Jaeger, you essentially can view uh, what is going on, where exactly along a request path um, the signals are, are happening, and then you can drill uh, down, but you can also look at percentiles, etc. All right. I mentioned already once uh, open telemetry and open telemetry i personally am super excited um, is a um, up and coming standard if you wish in the cncf it has its roots in the merger of two tracing efforts called open tracing and open census those two projects merged in cncf creating open telemetry so it has its roots in tracing so not very, uh, you know, surprising. You would expect that the tracing part in OTEL, Open Telemetry, uh, is already stabilized, and the work in terms of metrics is ongoing. And logs are, as a signal type, supported signal type, are also planned um, going forward and uh, currently experimental. And as you can see on the right hand side, covering pretty much all the relevant um, modern um, programming languages that you would uh, hope for and, and expect, including Java, Python, Go, uh, .NET. There are a couple of things in there um, that you want to pay attention to. Um, the, what is labeled here in the, in the open telemetry context as a backend, I called them destination earlier on. You have the collector, that's the telemetry bit, bit. and um, you know your application, the library, the SDK for your uh, programming language of choice allowing you to, as a developer, to uh, instrument your application and emitting whatever kind of signals you may wish to consume further down the line. And with that, we wrap up a summary and then looking forward to the Q&A. I think we are at a very interesting point in time, and that is that you do have the freedom of choice you can use the best of class 
for a particular use case. Meaning that along workloads, along signals, you might choose different tools, different methods um, to get uh, the result that you want. Remember, return of investment. There is this um, idea that as you are relying on open standards and open source, um, you can minimize your exposure in terms of um, being locked into a certain solution. So that's certainly uh, something you want to pay attention to. And last but not least, especially in this context of moving workloads from on-premises into the cloud, especially with open standards and open source, you can build portable observability systems, meaning you can deploy, for example, a Prometheus-based solution on-premises, and then when you move to the cloud, you can essentially, um, you can offload certain things to your cloud provider of choice, but you can essentially um, reuse that. A lot of that uh, is portable. All right, and with that, I'm very much looking forward to the Q&A. Thanks a lot for sticking around and talk to you in a bit. Hello, Michael, can you hear me? Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, the great presentation. Um, so I wanted to invite all the attendees. There's a, a chat off to the right. Please type your questions um, and Michael will be able to answer them here. Um, and then we don't get to them right now. There will be a, a, a live uh, Zoom room later that you can ask your questions directly in person. Um, so one of the things, Michael, I saw that you had a great slide that showed six dimensions of a system and the observability aspects, right. starting with the compute engine, working up to your data store and language, and then eventually getting to telemetry and analytics. Um, you highlighted one possible path up to there. Where can people go to get information to help them decide and figure out what's the right path for the solution they're trying to implement? Right, so what is the right path through these six dimensions that I came up with, but again, this is you know, up for discussion. Um, I strongly believe that there is not a single right path. It really very much depends on your requirements. Uh, it depends on what you already have. You might be um, you know, on premises or in, in the cloud um, already invested in certain systems or you, know, you might already pay a, a vendor for something. So you want to start with um, essentially what you currently have and see um, how a given uh, set of solutions might fit in there. For example, you might say, all right, I'm 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 taking that example because I work at AWS, so that's where I mostly know things. Um, you might be uh, using, I don't know, CloudWatch already and X-Ray and maybe thinking of using uh, AMP or a managed Prometheus uh, offering and then uh, working backwards from there, seeing how do I get signals in there, uh, for example, using open telemetry. There are luckily already quite some um, good resources out there. We are also investing in that space and, and definitely producing more. But at the end of the day, I would always recommend people to first look at what they already have, what is already established in their um, organization. Um, certain things like you know the programming languages or whatever, that's usually something that is already a, a given. That's not something you, you're going to change after the fact. Right. Um, so take take stock of what you have and work backwards from you know where you want to get. And I think one of the other aspects you talked about that wasn't on that slide, but was that you're, you need different signals for different roles. So if a developer is doing troubleshooting or profiling, <clears throat> they have different needs than the infrastructure team. How do you provide both and especially how do you not get in each other's way and step on each other's toes with too much information or not enough that the other one needs? Right. So the question is essentially how to make sure that every role that we see in such distributed systems, containerized uh, microservices or, or you know, functions or whatever, uh, get what they need to do their job, right? And um, the, the basic idea is that you um, 
make sure that you understand what is the, the most important, uh, both types of signal, but also most important tasks that someone has to um, you know, take care of. For example, if I'm responsible for the provisioning, I'm part of the platform team, I'm responsible for provisioning um, and making available a Kubernetes cluster to uh, teams that then you know, grab a namespace or grab a cluster and deploy their applications there, then um, I have questions, you know, around uh, and certain uh, SL SLOs and SLAs um, that come around that, um, you know, how fast can I provision a cluster? How uh, how much disruption uh, does a, an upgrade take? Um, now, what kind of signals can help me to to uh, answer the or support me to to meet my my um, my SLOs? And the same is true for for developers. With developers, there's one trend that we are now seeing in the context of you know shift left, so more focus on um, the actual um, operation, more or less, of of the of the microservices or or functions, um, meaning that more increasingly, especially in the cloud environment, the infrastructure is kind of offloaded or intentionally people offload this this part of the heavy lifting to the cloud providers, meaning that uh, developers um, potentially might be on call for, for you know, um, their code. And um, if you want to go all the way into actually hand out pagers, or nowadays it's, it's probably it's apps and not the, the good old pagers, but you know, uh, essentially being being on call for um, you know, your, your code. And we do that in, in Amazon quite quite uh, you know, successfully, and you know there are other um, widely adopted um, methods and methodologies like SREs um, that you know across the, the board. That's something that uh, companies look at and and increasingly also adopt. So it really depends on what are the goals, what are the SLAs, SLOs, SLIs, and, and then looking at the different signals that can help me in a specific role to do that. And then I think that leads to one of the questions when you're talking about specific goals. One of the questions came in on the chat from Gary was, how might some of the tracing tools allow us to measure latency for streaming data that's passing through many services? That's a super interesting question. And there are two parts to it. The one where I'm personally more um, optimistic and and um, you know sure that we are doing, uh, we as in the, the, the community, um, CNCF and wider open source community. Um, and that is in, in the context of your own code, right? If you ask myself uh, or anyone out there, um, how do you go about uh, instrumenting the code? You know that's pretty pretty much done, right? You have uh, all these these SDKs, all these these libraries that you can use to instrument your code. Where it's a little bit um, harder or or less complete covered is um, when it comes to what I called infra and data. So essentially everything that is opaque to you, where you just have an API and you don't know what's going on behind that. You get some logs or whatever out of that. And in my experience, that is certainly something that uh, where we as a whole um, as a community of, of practitioners we need to invest more that we can uh, effectively create and and support that kind of experience for um, actual uh, you know tracing and, and and the likes for for also streaming data and another question from the chat from Jen, what for an organization that's just getting started with observability and working with a managed service that you don't have direct access to those systems, what are the, the first steps that you would recommend when they have that black box scenario? Right, right. I, I always um, recommend and I'm a big fan of uh, small steps and, and having um, ideally in a greenfield environment, if possible, um, having quick um, results and and iterations quick feedback loops so that you see um are you on the right track or you know does a certain um, direction uh, actually pay off so you don't want you know to end up in a situation where uh you know your overall observability um setup uh you know in terms of footprint in terms of costs overall you know store signals etc um effort that people have to put in um is more than more you know more than i don't know 10 percent or 20 percent um of the actual functionality of the system so you want to keep an eye on that in terms of budget 
the the you know license cost or whatever that's always the easiest to to assess right how much do i pay vendor x to you know use a certain dashboard or whatever but um do you also consider how much effort it is for your developers to instrument the code um how much you know there might be um work in terms of um you know deploying agents and then you know um, everything that is part of the telemetry and you know you, you want to keep an eye on that and by quick iterating uh, figure out are you on the right track or not and bottom line really is it's almost always a uh, organizational challenge not so much a tooling challenge i think that goes to the next question that martin had about instrumenting um applications with vendor specific code using a bridge to get it into your your current vendor so if you already have you know monitoring tools or analytics tools um is, is have you worked with those or have you seen success with using a, a bridging solution yeah i would i would say that at the current point in time um we are in this transitioning phase where uh, i mentioned earlier on that you know open telemetry came out of open census and and uh, open tracing uh, and and with that a number of more vendor specific um, SDKs, et cetera, et cetera. And we are now as we speak, um, you know, March 2021, um, in this, uh, you know, moving towards a, a situation where essentially the open telemetry, of course, with different uh, the different distributions that are maintained by by different vendors, but essentially the open telemetry um, collector and the, the SDK there um, enables this kind of portability. Sh shouldn't be a, a, um, a huge issue, but I'm super interested in uh, Martin or whoever uh, runs into that. If you have any um, data points, even if it's you know only anecdotal or whatever, please do share with me. I'm, I'm super interested in that topic as well. And you you showed a small part of the uh, the CNCF landscape with all those little cards yeah. on it, and just I think just for observability and analysis, they had over a hundred different options, which can be daunting. Right. I think the full landscape has almost a thousand now at this point of different right. tools and vendors. Um, you've mentioned open telemetry obviously a few times. That sounds like a good first step. What are some other first things should people should be looking at and saying, okay, I want to start using the the CNCF guidance? to decide what right. to use in our system, what else should they be looking at as a first option? So the um, kind of like no brainer to me, at least are uh, Prometheus for um, metrics. Um, this is a, a low hanging fruit. So if you are not not already using it, you definitely should. Uh, based on that, and in, in this context, the uh, Prometheus uh, exposition format was the basis for what is now called open metrics. So a, a wire format to, um, you know, transfer uh, the the metrics represent and transfer these metrics um and uh, for logs uh, definitely fluent bit i'm calling out fluent bit and not uh, fluent d uh, although both are our uh, cncf projects um because we found uh, that fluent bit in terms of the footprint um uh, has a a uh, you know a, a better profile uh, although there are less uh, plugins available for fluent bit compared to fluent d um going forward in terms of future um you know investment uh, if you're now uh, adopting it i would i would uh, recommend fluent bit over fluent d so these are um and obviously with with Prometheus comes Grafana. That's kind of like a, another low hanging fruit where, you know, um, very often you find these uh, Grafana dashboards almost, you know, integrated part coming coming out of the box, uh, part of the, the solution in like in service lash land, service mesh land. Nice, <laughs> nice gotcha there. Um, and so I would, in general, as long as um, you see, and that's a general question in terms of how do you assess the um healthiness and the you know how, how much traction a certain uh, open source project has um be part of that you know there are slack uh, communities uh, for that there are uh, github issues etc cetera, etc cetera. so you should be part of that and, and make that um part of your strategy right it's not uh, that you're just grabbing some piece of code and, and using it, you are by using it, you're part of that community. And, you know, the very least you can do is uh, provide feedback. Um, and then you also uh, usually have a forum to exchange experiences with your peers. Sounds good. Um, 
you did talk a little bit at some point about portability, and I like the idea, especially as people are talking about migrating from a monolith to microservices or just distributed system architecture, and the idea of moving from on-prem to the cloud. So if the company has uh, a lot of aging on-prem infrastructure, and they're saying, we're going to make this transition to the cloud. Um, is there something that people can do to start adding observability now that might help during that transition process? Right. So in terms of portability across different environments, I particularly focus on this something is on-premises, and we've seen that uh, in the last couple of, of months and in year um, that, that that is accelerating. Um, you want to uh, make sure, again, I always come back to these open specifications um, for the down the line open standards um, and open source, because that is something that, you know, on-premises, you can run it yourself, you can deploy it yourself, you have full visibility in there, no pun intended. You can, you know, um, if necessary, if, if you have the engineering muscles, you can fix stuff yourself. Um, or maybe even, um, and that's something where many organizations um, maybe need to do a little bit more thinking, and that is investment in the community, right? We very often see um, open source as this kind of like, oh, great, I get something for free. Sure, <laughs> you can use open source for free, but don't expect that, uh, you know, you get free support, right? So make sure that, you know, uh, one very important part of that strategy is that you are considering yourself being part of the community. It's not just just a vendor where you get something from. You are part of the community and um, raising issues and potentially, if you can, even you know, sending in pull requests to uh, advance something or, or fix a bug um, should be part of that strategy, right? And and again, if you listen carefully, this is not a technological issue, right? This is again a organizational issue. Is the organization as such? Uh, ready to do that, right? I think we have time for one more question before we go to the uh, the next room. The uh, so Jen had another question. What are key metrics that AWS uses for observability? So key, key metrics is a little bit uh, an ambiguous term. I'm not entirely sure if you mean. Um, metrics as in the, the signal type uh, but I'm, I'm gonna interpret it in a way unless i see something on the on the chat that corrects me there um i'm gonna um interpret well, maybe it in maybe way. hold that thought because it's it's about time i just saw the um oh. message pop up that we're going to continue the conversation if you want to continue okay. talking to michael or ask questions directly um join us there's a link right there in the, the chat room, or if you close this back on the schedule, there's a link to join to continue the conversation. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I want to thank Michael Hassenblas for his great presentation today. So join us in the Zoom room. It'll be an informal Q&A. Um, please turn on your camera and then chat live. You don't have to type any of your questions in. Um, so yeah, like I said, the link is over there or back on the schedule. And thank you again, Michael, for your time today. Thanks a lot for having me. Cheers.